talk about Lily Kish's effect in the economy, the spending crisis we face in the year. This is unprecedented, and, and again, will affect in a big way. Then the future of the president's health care plan. Let's dive into it. The main job support, 69,000. Uh, the June one, 80,000. Fewest jobs in a year. Job growth is slowed by two thirds. Business consumer confidence down. We're doing much better in Texas, as you'd imagine, much better in Houston as well. A lot of the country is still struggling. Here we are, three, uh, three years after the recession ended and four and a half years after it began. We need to change that. 40th straight month, 41st now, of unemployment, above 8%. Uh, part of the problem is we have the fewest number of, working, of people working in 30 years. We have millions who have just given up, dropped out. In fact, that's why the unemployment rate is down at 8%. It really is much closer to 11%. If you just put in the people who've given up looking for work, so you know actual unemployment rates a lot higher. So we've got some real challenges. Economic projections for 2012 have just been cut by everyone from the Federal Reserve to blue chip, and we just with the June recovery or June uh, jobs numbers, uh, the president's recovery uh, in both job creation and economic growth. You can measure it either way. There's been 10 recessions. 10 recoveries since World War II. This ranks dead last in both those categories. We've got to do better than what we're doing today. Unemployment rate, as you know, uh, Congress passed a huge stimulus, uh, 800 and some billion dollars. A lot of promises were made. At this point, we were told the unemployment would be 5.8%. Obviously, it's a lot higher in real life, even higher than that. It's interesting. We've had the most severe recession we've had uh, was when President Reagan uh, inherited almost 10.8% unemployment, higher than the one we have today, he took a different route on, on sort of lowering taxes, getting Washington out of the way of recovery. And as you can tell at this point, the growth under that recovery was just dramatically uh, better than what we have today. In fact, just comparing apples to apples, if, we, if this recovery was just average, this middle of the road, we had four million people going back to work today and uh, they're looking for work. And if it was at the Reagan model of real rapid uh, recovery, we'd have almost seven million people again head to work this morning. We, we gotta do better. Uh, the American economy isn't doing fine. If you look at this, I'll skip through it real quickly, but um, you can tell payroll employment, on average, it should be 6% gain by now. We're actually down. Real economic growth should be 14%. It's a fraction of that. Consumer spending, personal income, consumer credit, all that stuff. We're just way, way, way behind where we ought to be. Spending. This is uh, this chart shows the spending future of America. Um, the the red is the debt uh, we will run up as a nation. The green is the in, is the revenue. You can tell, start with the revenue, the green force, you can tell there's been some peaks and valleys, but overall, you know, since World War II, we generate about 19% of our economy. We generate it and set aside to fund the federal government. And when the economy picks back up, it'll pick up, up to that level as well. Here's the problem, it is the red. The red line spending it is nowhere near, and you can tell here we are, 2012, we're just starting to explode. Um, put this in two thoughts, two points about this chart. One, it makes it clear you can't tax your way back to a balanced budget. It's impossible. We could double everyone's taxes in this room. We still would run as a nation a deficit this year. Uh, you can tag, you take every dime of the wealthy, take every dime they've ever earned, you wouldn't even pay for the deficit for this year either. So you've got to control spending if we want to get back to living within our means as a country. The other point about this, because we have two young boys, we have a 10-year-old a, uh, and a 13-year-old, I'm always thinking about these things in terms of a family. And here's, here's what this chart says. A baby born today in Katy, Texas. Uh, their share of this red ink is already about $47,000. So a baby born today owes Uncle Sam a new Lexus. If we don't change our spending, by the time they're 13, they'll owe a second one. 
And by the time they're 22 and finishing college and trying to get out to go start their own life, they'll owe Uncle Sam a third Lexus. Now the good news is, young people don't actually buy luxury sedans for Uncle Sam, but they pay the price a different way. What this chart shows is when that young person turns 22 and they're getting ready to start their life, economic growth will slow considerably, so there will be fewer jobs for them. Taxes will be higher to pay for them, so they'll keep less of what they earn. Interest rates will be higher, so things they buy will be more expensive. So the price young people pay for all the spending today is fewer jobs and less in their pocket once they get that job. So there's a real life impact for the spending we have today. Uh, at the end of the year, looking ahead, this tax cliff you've all been reading about, it really is unprecedented. On Ways and Means Committee, I've never seen it in the years that I've been in Congress. Some provisions have already expired. The R&D tax credit, which is critical to innovation in America. State and local sales tax deduction, that's the provision I'm in charge of for Texas. For us, you know, we've always thought it unfair that states that have an income tax get to deduct that from what they owe every April 15th. So in 2004, we put together a seven-state coalition, fought hard, got it restored, so you and I can deduct our states and local sales taxes. That saves you and me about $1.2 billion a year. We don't have a cent up there. That's already expired. The 100% depreciation, which is what businesses use to help buy new capital equipment, international business provisions, some of which affect McDermott and the biofuels tax credit, that's already expired. The end of the year, all the tax rates, all brackets, all rates, Anyone who says it's just for the wealthy that's expiring, I'm telling you, everything you pay in taxes at the federal level goes up January 1st unless Congress acts. The alternative minimum tax, which was, um, it was sort of the buffet rule of its day. It was created in the end of the 1960s because 55 families in 155 families in America weren't paying their fair share. So rather than fix the tax code, they create a second tax to capture. Well, today that 155 has now grown to, if the, if the alternative minimum tax isn't stopped by January 1st, about 31 million Americans will pay a second tax because Uncle Sam didn't get you enough on the first one. And so that, uh, that the debt tax, the number of business, number of reason family-owned businesses and Farms aren't passed down to their kids. Payroll tax, holiday, all in. The debt tax springs back to life. So does capital gains increasing dramatically. Child tax credit, the marriage penalty comes back. College tax credits, if you're raising, if you're sending your kids to college, all that, all that <coughs> expires uh, December 31st. And here's here's the impact for us for residents of Eighth District of Texas. Uh, it will raise your taxes about. $3,600. Uh, if you're a senior, uh, it will have even a bigger impact because dividends will double in taxes. And for most seniors, for pa your parents, if they have any revenue besides Social Security, it's a good chance it's going to be dividend revenue. So Uncle Sam will take twice as much of that as they do today. So it's going to make it tougher for, um, for seniors to make it especially in the zero interest uh, rate environment. So big impact on all of you. The end of the year also has some automatic spending cuts um, uh, to defense that uh, I think are the wrong uh, cuts. The, what it will do is on January 1st, we'll start to hollow out our military. They estimate uh, about 100,000 soldiers, sailors, Marines, and airmen will be cut from service. It would create the smallest ground force since 1940, the smallest level of ships since 1915, smallest tactical fighter force in the history of the force. Texas pays a huge price for this because we're number two in the country in defense. Number of active duty military will lose is almost 22,000. The total Texas jobs lost about 125,000. In the House, uh, I think the Pentagon wastes money. Uh, and I know they do, especially in their procurement, the way they buy things, especially with more expensive weapons systems. In fact, I've introduced legislation to cut the Department of Defense, not in troops, not in their support, but in the way they buy things. These cuts go way beyond what you want for, for security in, in this country. The House, we've already acted 
we passed a bill that cuts more, $242 billion from the federal budget uh, over the next uh, 10 years to offset those cuts. It's now sitting in the Senate. And this week, later this week, we're going to pass a bill that sort of forces the White House to tell us exactly where those cuts will occur because we think um, people will be stunned by it. More American-made energy. This has been a real challenge. We, you know, you know this, but too many lawmakers in Washington don't know we're going through a revolution right now. Onshore with the oil shale, you know, we're working our way back in the Gulf of Mexico. But there are a lot of opportunities for investment around the world for companies. They don't have to invest in energy in America. We have the chance, really, a, a game-changing chance to, to shape our own future in energy. But we have a lot of objections to it. In the House, um, we've passed legislation that really opens the door for putting energy fully back to work in America, uh, including uh, opening up uh, that small part of the Alaska Wildlife Reserve for energy exploration, more offshore drilling, uh, and opening up more leases. Uh, Keystone XL pipeline, which is one of key pipelines, one of many that would be critical to moving this around. Uh, the energy bill that we passed would create about one million new jobs and creates, this is interesting, today we hear a lot of talk about we need higher taxes in Washington to pay the deficit. Um, what we need is more revenue, not higher taxes. And we leave on the table about $80 billion dollars, uh, over the next 10 years that if we put energy fully back to work, not only does it create a boatload of jobs, it creates a lot of revenue to pay down the deficit as well. Uh, uh, the uh, uh, API did this uh, chart uh, for us based on the president's budget. He includes, the president's got about $85 billion in tax increases on you and others. And look at the choice between this. If we, if we put energy back to work fully, we're looking at a million new jobs, a lot more government revenue, a lot more energy production. But if we tax those same companies and, and raise the cost of capital, look, we lose jobs, we lose revenue, we lose production. You know, pretty easy choice, I think, for most Americans. Here's what's interesting. Only three states in the country have gained back all the jobs from the recession and are on the plus side. Texas, Alaska, and North Dakota. What do those three states have in common? Energy development. They ought to be the model for what we're doing. If we could export that model to the rest of the states, federal government, we could actually do some pretty good things for the economy and really good things for the deficit as well. Uh, we'll talk about, we, we need to talk about this, but basically, you know, the more the Federal Reserve weakens the price of the dollar, the more you and I pay the pump. In fact, last summer, uh, you and I, because the currency had been devalued because of quantitative easing one and two, you and I are paying about 50 cents more a gallon of gas. Today it's about 37%, 37 cents more a gallon of gas because of our currency and the value. So it's got to be Healthcare, let's finish with this. This is, uh, <laughs> this is your healthcare system in America as amended by the Supreme Court. Uh, joining common committee, I run the joining common committee for the Republicans in the House and the Senate. And after that massive bill passed 2,801 pages, I asked for economy, or, uh, 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 economic staff to go through every provision, page by page, and I said, put it on an organization chart for America to see. And this is what they developed. Uh, and uh, this is an accurate one. In fact, if you go to our website, in every line, and every box, embedded in there is exact provision that creates this. And as you can tell, the physicians are over here, the patients are over here, in between 159 new government agencies, bureaucracies and commissions that are now involved in your health care. In fact, many of them, between you and your doctor, they're interjected. At the center of it is a health and human services secretary. Everything on color except that uh, circle is newly created or expanded uh, by the government. Uh, the, 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 uh, everything is blue, in blue is expanded government. Everything in rust are, are the future rationing uh, agencies that will control costs by, by not paying your doctor to treat you, basically. Everything is green is either new taxes, 
about $600 billion in new taxes, and about half a trillion dollars in Medicare cuts. This is to Medicare Advantage, if your folks are on that program, local hospitals, um, health nursing homes, hospice care. The blue areas uh, are a, a new expansion in the free market, and so is the light blue. And the IRS is up there because under this bill, they estimate that the IRS eventually will have to hire about 16,000 new agents to enforce this bill. Um, question marks are the Medicaid provision that the Supreme Court struck down. The white area up there is the Class Act, which has been suspended. And so this is your new health care system. And I'll make one final point. We couldn't fit, fit, fit it all on one chart. That's one token of the new bureaucracy in the health care system, laid on top of what we already have. And so I, I, I think the President was right to tackle health care reform. It could not continue the way it was. I don't think this is the solution most Americans thought that they would get out of it. So uh, we voted to repeal that. We're ready to replace it. We, we think some focus on lowering the cost. Um, but, and I'll conclude with this. Really, the Supreme Court basically said, and I think they were dead wrong in their decision and dead wrong in their thinking of their, that decision. They basically opened, created a roadmap so the federal government can grow as big as it wants as long as it ties it to a tax penalty. So it can compel you to enter into a private contract, buy a private product, as long as they enforce it with the tax penalty. I think that is bad for future generations. But what they essentially said was, if you read the ruling, they said, we can't save the American public from their own political decisions. They, in effect, pushed it back to you. And so in November, when you and I go to the poll, really is going to be America's going to make some key decisions. You're going to make some key decisions. One of them is the problem now that the government spends too much, or is the problem they take too little of your income? Because that's the heart of every issue right now in Washington is based on that. Should we raise taxes, take more from it, or should we rein in this? How large a government do you want, and how large are you willing to pay for? Because at the end of the day, you guys do it. I mean, you pay for the size of government. Right now, we're almost at the highest level in American history. And then finally, do you want the president's health care plan to stand as law of the land? Because in effect, uh, it will come down to voters if they want to continue it uh, and, and implement it, or if they want to reverse course, start with a clean slate and move from there. So, Steve, with your permission, can I stop? And let's just, it's Monday morning, so I, I just want to take some easy questions <laughs> this morning. It's the start of the week, but I didn't want to come out down and get hammered by you guys. So, why don't we, why don't we open it up and take some questions or comments? Are you as depressed as you know I might be going through all this stuff? <laughs> Sir, yeah, that's right. Uh, maybe on a lighter topic, maybe you can talk about potential vice presidential choices for Obama. Your thoughts on that? Yeah, there's some good uh, there's some good choices for him. Almost an embarrassment of riches. Um, you know, I think you look at top tier Rob Portman from Ohio. Sir, I served with him on Ways and Means a committee, worked in a very bipartisan manner, very smart was President Bush's both budget director and trade representative. So he's the full package, he's getting a lot of attention today because he's from Ohio. But if you look, uh, well, you look at him and the uh, Johnsons and the Paul Ryans and even some of the governors, Mitch Daniels taking himself out, but uh, I think Governor Romney could make any one of six choices and they are, they would be ready to step into the White House in the future of that. Do you have a preference? No. I think I think there'll be. Uh, yeah, he's got some great choices. The Senate. Uh, my conventional wisdom is it's a 50-50 uh, uh, chance that the Senate will move from Democrat to Republican. Either way, it's going to be very close, 51-49, probably either direction. So a lot depends on some of the battleground states. So it's going to be close. Can I ask you this? Your view, given a choice between 
problem is the government spends too much, or we ought to it ought to pay more of your income. <laughs> Do I need to ask this question? How, how many think the problem is we can spend too much? Um, can I ask you this? Uh, we have in here, do we have our Social Security Medicare slides? Our biggest challenge is going forward. One of the reasons that chart was well. Our key programs, Social Security, Medicare, for example, and Medicaid, um, are on unsustainable uh, paths. They continue to grow and grow and grow. In fact, each day, today, 10,000 Americans will sign up for Social Security. Tomorrow, 10,000 will sign up. The day after, 10,000 will sign up. On and on and on. It's just growing so much faster when we have workers. Uh, there's solutions to all of them, but my question is, um, you think we ought to wait to save Social Security and Medicare? It seems to me the longer we delay, and on the Ways and Means Committee, we handle both those programs. I'm number two on the Social Security Committee. Uh, a lot of people keep saying there's not a problem, we shouldn't deal with this, let's put it off for another year. But every year we delay. Social Security is a good example. We just heard from the accountants, the trustees, two weeks ago. They said Social Security has never been in a worse position than it is today. It's deteriorated more in the last year than it has in almost 20 years. Their point is, if you don't act soon, that program is not going to be around for you for younger people. It'll be if you're 55 or older. Social Security is set for you. It's pretty much cash flow works. Not much of an impact. But if you're under that, under 55. Yeah, everyone under 55. Grumbling. Uh, my question is, do you think we ought to tackle it now? So it's good. How many think we ought to stop delaying action to save those programs? Thank you. I, I'll tell you, Washington's, I think, behind the times. We're so frightened about making this change. In, my, in our district, in Texas, you know, people just want truth tellers. Just tell us the truth about the problem. Give us a couple options. But act. You'll listen to us and then act. Yes, sir. Mr. Brady, you uh, you give an opportunity to go speak with universities, economic <coughs> schools. Uh, I'm afraid that's where that's that's the level of, uh, of our citizens that would really need to take heed to this. Well, there's no question. Younger people uh, in those universities, almost every issue we're tackling now actually isn't so much about you and me. It's definitely about them. I mean, they're the ones who have to pay all the, the price of the slower economy and higher taxes, Social Security, Medicare. But more importantly, if government's so large, it's going to crowd out a lot of opportunities. You know what I mean? For them to be able to move up. And I was taking a look at, at, uh, at, at, we're releasing some studies for the Joint Econ Committee that are amazing. What they show is America is so mobile. We're such a land of opportunity. The group of Americans most likely to move into the upper middle class or middle class in America are children born of the poorest parents in America. Are, have the highest statistical chance of moving from the bottom fifth to the upper half in America. You look at the Forbes top 400 wealthiest Americans, 70% of them started with zero in their pocket as entrepreneurs. And we took a look at the last 18 years of tax returns, not by name, just by how much they paid. Past 18 years, only four people stay on there. In fact, in any given year, the top taxpayers in America, almost half of them, are brand new. They have moved themselves all the way up. So we've got to make sure for younger people, it's not just the burden of government. Boy, they need to have the same opportunities. You know what I mean? That you and I have to work on that. you agree with that? Yes, sir. How do you propose to save Social Security? There's two approaches we can take. I would call one is mild and one is spicy. Now, the mild one uh, is recognizing that if we stay with the, the pay-as-you-go system now where you and I pay out of our paycheck, it goes to our parents or grandparents. If we stick with that format, two things solve Social Security. One, over the next 35 years, you gradually raise the age to 70 and you tie Social Security benefits to real cost of living increases. If you do those two things, you basically make it solvent forever. That's the mile. That's probably the politically easiest one to do. 
and can, should be done tomorrow. If you want to go a little spicier, which I would like to see us do, we were talking about a few moments ago, there's some great models that have been working for years and years and years. One of them is in Galveston, right down the road. Three counties in 1983, 84, they voted, the county employees actually voted to take themselves out of Social Security. They put the same contribution you and I do into interest-bearing accounts, and their Social Security benefits today, and the same thing you and I do, are about two and a half times larger, three months, because they made their money work for it. The difference, too, is those accounts are theirs. Right now in Social Security, you don't own that account. I mean, the Supreme Court has ruled it is not yours. The virtual account, back with virtual assets. And if you die early, tough. In Galveston, that is their plan. They own it. And if they die early, it goes to their spouse or goes to the kids that have a disability program like Social Security. But what they basically did was they made the money work for them. I would like to see that. An option for younger workers, they don't have to do it, but an option for younger workers where they can opt to put some portion of Social Security into an account like that that grows over time. So my dream is someday when you retire, you don't go to Uncle Sam to ask for your retirement. You take your account to your financial advisor and decide how you're going to use it the rest of your life. That's where eventually I think we ought to go as a country. What, what are your thoughts? What do you think? Um, I don't know the answer. But uh, on the Galveston people that took, them, that took themselves out of Social Security, how did they go about doing that? Is that what's the process there? You won't be surprised to know they closed that loophole shortly after Galveston did. <laughs> um, actually, up to that point, you can actually do that uh, as organizations. In fact, that's the teacher retirement system in Texas did that 50 years ago. Now they have a substitute for Social Security like Galveston, and they, you know, they invested in real assets as well. Their rate of returns you know, dramatically more than the federal government. Now their problem is they haven't had the state contribute. They haven't had cost of living increases in far too long, but they have real assets back in their retirement fund. Social Security last year as a nation. We had to go to China, foreign investors, and others. We had to borrow $140 billion to pay Social Security benefits. This year, we'll have to go out and beg for another $150 billion just to pay our seniors Social Security. That's wrong. I don't care who, what you're thinking. We can't continue to do that. What was the logic? It seems like they reduced the Social Security they took out on certain employees. What was the logic behind reducing the Social Security tax? Uh, not much. Uh, it was uh, part of the payroll. It was a payroll tax holiday. I think was a mistake. It, it saves you money. There's no question. You have more money in your paycheck today because of that payroll tax holiday. It blew a hole in Social Security. Technically, it did. They said, "Oh, we'll we'll put general revenue in there," but there is no general revenue to put in there. We had to borrow, so it blew a huge hole in Social Security. That payroll tax holiday. I know it's people enjoy that extra money, we can't do that. I mean, you're taking a, a sixth of all the revenue for that important program and, and dumping it, so we can't continue. That goes away at the end of this year? Yes. Okay. Oh, cool. Now, I know it won't be popular, but dang, we just can't do that. Can't do that. Can I answer this? How many of you, for younger workers, would like to see the option of being able to put some portion into an account, a pool account that would grow over time. Yeah. Or at least explore the idea of it. Yeah, let's talk about it. Let's talk about it. We had a hand up here yesterday. Actually, I don't know the answer to this question. What's the last year the federal government had a balanced budget? Uh, it was um, 1996. So 2000, 2001. My follow up question would be you know, other than times of war, deficit spend or, or reason to deficit spend. Why is that a lot? Um, because we don't have a, two, two reasons. You don't elect the right people to balance the budget. Secondly, I think we need a constitutional amendment, you know, that, that says basically except in times of war or emergency, you have to live within your means as a country. It's common sense. It's 
states do it, you have to do it basically. This business and the government certainly has to do it. So I, I think we all have that balanced budget. What do you think? I agree. It's just common sense. And I know people argue this and that. Look, do we want should we live within our means or not? Do we want that chart or not? Yes, sir. What's the line of work? Yeah, what's the likelihood? We had a vote on it earlier this year, and we fell short in the House of getting the two thirds to send it over to the Senate. It's still a challenge. I'm, I'm a co sponsor, uh, but I, I think it's the absolute right thing to do. Some argue should have a percentage on it. No. Look, here's the principle do we live within our means or not? I mean, I, I don't have a balance, but personally, you know, but at some point in time, I'm going to be a house. And that's, that's what he's insane about two thirds. <laughs> you can't print money. That's the difference. <laughs> yes, sir. And then we'll come down here. Along those lines, what are the, the biggest areas that you see in control spending? What would be, specifically, what would be cut in the low hanging fruit that you see? In a general sense, here, here's what we need to do. We need to take, uh, do we have that chart? Um, I can look. Unless you have to. I like that popcorn. Um, um, if you look at our budget in a pie chart, one third of it is what we call discretionary funding. We actually budget that each year. Almost two thirds are those automatic programs, Social Security, Medicare, food stamps, Medicaid, interest on the debt, things sort of on autopilot. Everyone focuses on that one third slot, which would be like your air traffic controllers, highway funding, education, VA, veterans care, things like that. But the real challenge is in the automatic side. So generally, what we need to do is we need to take that one-third uh, portion and we need to take it back to 2008 levels. We had a big government in 2008 and leave it there for about five years, basically force everyone to become more efficient in the government, deliver the service. You've got, you got to stay at that level. So first thing you do is, is bring that in. Second, we got to take the tackle Social Security and Medicare and make them solvent. And over time, you can. Over time, you can bend that curve. If you do that, we actually could have a balanced budget for a long, long time. The problem is we're in such a hole, deep hole right now, it is hard to, to, it's hard to actually up there for people to imagine us to get back to it. But we don't have a choice. We've got to get back to it. There's some, in the House, we passed a budget, um, the Ryan budget, that balances a, a little over a decade. House conservatives, I'm mean, one of them, has passed a budget that balances in five years. It's pretty tough love. I mean, it's it's pretty tough, but I just think the sooner we can get back in balance, the better off we're going to be this long term. What do you think? I agree. I mean, look. <laughs> to uh, Mike's point, I mean, everybody in here personally has to manage to a budget and cut, cut costs ourselves in certain situations, so it makes sense to, uh, to have some lean times from a government spending as well. But the part that's frustrating is probably, I don't know if that's a political sell, and obviously you've got to manage what you can sell to a public in terms of voting on, on what is politically palatable to the general public. All this fits into the ma that major end of the year issue, which is does government spend too much or does it tax too little? Um, it just seems to me government ought to tighten their belt before they ask you to tighten yours, you know, with higher taxes. So, it's, it's How much of every federal dollar that right now is borrowed mm -hmm. and the Yeah, we're borrowing 40 cents of every dollar right now. And, and we have such a low interest rate in borrowing costs, it masks the pain of this deficit spending. It's like we're living on a teaser rate, you know what I mean? An adjustable rate mortgage number right now, that teaser credit card rate. When it goes back to its historical levels, our deficits are going to balloon. By some estimates, we'll move from about $250 billion a year in interest payments to 800 to a trillion a year a year not total a year so we're 
We're, we're that subprime mortgage loan owner who bought way above what they could afford and are praying those rates don't come up anytime soon. Another reason we gotta get our financial house in order now, not, not later. Yes, sir. Why didn't we get a space shuttle? <laughs> <laughs> this would be politically correct. There is no political correct. There is not one on that one. Uh, it, it was just, it was, it was absolutely unacceptable that we did not. There is no reason, no excuse, no justification. We, our region, not only is responsible for man and flight, you know, we, we've given 17 lives over the course of the space program. To, to allow us to go to the moon, to allow us to have a space station. There was zero reason it should have gone to New York. Zero. You know, I know what we got, and we're going to make the best, you know, of the market that we have. It's going to be a great tourism thing, but it was it was a huge slap in the face. And coming on top of having 4,000 of our workers transferred to Florida for the program, and basically, you can keep the training of astronauts in Houston, we're just not going to train any more astronauts. That's essentially what the policy of the country is today. Um, yeah, it was just adding insult to you. Yes, sir. I want to shift the conversation a little bit, maybe to education that might not be in your particular mm -hmm. spot, but your opinion, mm -hmm. being a member. Um, the context is this room is filled with financial experts, engineers, scientists, and international folks. And we travel the world and see other countries and the product of their educational systems. And we wonder what's happening in this country and what can be done about it. We see a slippage, it's been reported. There's a differential in quality, uh, I think, of education in this country versus the past 25 years. And in particular, math, sciences, and engineering. What are your thoughts about what we can do? Yeah, there is, uh, people often talk about there's an income gap in America between the rich and the poor. We have a skills gap in America between the rich and the poor. That's exactly what drives uh, all of this, and especially uh, in the highly skilled workers. And we are, you know, you all know the numbers, how much we're falling behind on those, on those science, uh, math, technology, engineering degrees. But to put it in local terms, uh, I, I can't tell you how many roundtables we have with business industry groups around our region. We always ask them what I asked you this morning, what's the biggest challenge? And for them, it is finding skilled workers. And they're recruiting around the globe. And one, we were at a roundtable, I don't know, a month ago here in Houston. Company after company was telling me how many jobs they left on the table and how much work they left on the table they just could not accept because they didn't have those jobs. They're just begging for them. And again, many of them compete internationally, so you got to recruit internationally. So we've got to dramatically increase our STEM uh, degrees here in America. But it goes all the way down the line. In fact, joining the Economic Committee is, uh, we just um, released two out of a series of three papers on income inequality. And the third one is basically going to say, Inequality is caused by a skills gap and the marriage gap. In the sense that those who spend the extra time to get a degree, either, either technical, you know, or science, math, any of those, as well as those who live in two earner income families, have the brightest future going forward. And, and by the way, I'm also the best work pool, you know, education pool workforce for the country. Uh, and those who don't get those that educational skills, and those who have the bottom quarter of Americans don't have those skills, and they're in a family where less than one person works on that, they're going to have the toughest time. You know what I mean? Moving up, and so it seems to me we've got to get the workforce. If we're going to innovate, if we're going to actually out innovate, and you mentioned it today, as you see in Korea. And China, Asia, and others diving deeply into the market that you're in today, 
that translates into lost revenue and jobs for endurance. So we not to be dramatically got to up our game on the education level. I think we're just about out of time. Let me finish with this. One, I want to thank you for being here today. If you've got some, we've got uh, an e-newsletter. We've got uh, a bunch. We are on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, unfortunately. A lot of uh, other things. So if you've got a thought, sign up. Come to our website. You know, let us make sure we're, we're listening as well as engaging you. Let me finish with this story. Uh, a few years ago, uh, have you ever heard this Lone Star Honor flight? It's where they take the World War II veterans up to Washington to see the monument that was created for them. Well, in Texas, we had a, 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 a junior high teacher, Brenda Beeman from uh, Montgomery, decided she was going to do it for her. So she got her students involved in raising money. Then she got the community involved in raising money. They've done five of these flights. All of them are the same. They leave at 4 in the morning in the dark at the Target parking lot in Conway. They put them on buses, all the World War II veterans. And you know they're getting up there in age. In fact, about 1,000 a day are dying. And so they put them in with a young escort for the day. They have the Patriot Guard riders take them down to Bush. They fly to Washington. They go to the monument dedicated to them and their sacrifice. Lay a wreath at the Texas column. They see a couple other columns. They fly home the same day. They don't get home until about 2 in the morning. It's a long day. On every flight, all five flights, same thing happens. The flight back, all those young escorts, all those veterans, had <laughs> away, hearing me reconnecting. Yeah, they tell us it's one of the best days of their life. Uh, but anyway, at every one of these uh, uh, um, uh, Lone Star uh, flights, uh, we, we, provide, we provide the coffee and donuts and Send them on the way. And so uh, I meet a hero or two, the fifth and final flight. They're just boarding the buses. These two women come up and say, Can we meet, can, Congressman, can you meet our dad? We think he's a real hero. So absolutely. So I go to the bus, he's boarding. So I meet Mr. Billy Trio of Trinity, Texas. Turns out Billy Trio was the youngest serving Marine in World War II. He enlisted when he was 13 years old. He was shot at the Guadalcanal uh, at Fort. He had two more conflicts. The Battle of Saipan, seriously wounded, was hospitalized for eight months. He finished his full tour of duty two weeks shy of his 17th Think about it. Uh, I got to go up to Trinity at, at the Legion Hall and among his friends and family. We're all in awe of him and present him the Purple of Heart he earned at Saipan. When we took the microphone, he said, as many of our veterans do, I'm no hero. This is what Americans do to each other, for each other. In fact, I had coffee with him the other day. He said, I'd go back if they have left him. And this is a, this is a, a hero. You know, all the way through the same time as being Billy Trio as Sergeant Eddie Wright from Willis, Texas. You may have read about him in 2004. And I rock fell propelled grenade hit his uh, vehicle, blew off both of his arms, huge hole in his left femur. He's bleeding out, still calls him help, saves his unit. The community came together uh, helping heroes based here in, in Houston to build a home specifically for his disabilities. And, and we're in a room about this size, raising the final $80,000 for the home. And he takes a microphone. And among his remarks, because I remember this portion, he said, from time to time, someone will say, gosh, if you just go back to that day, if you could just have your arms back and your life back, wouldn't that be? Remarkable, and his answer is absolutely not. He said, The American people, Texans, have been so appreciative of his sacrifice. He said, they, They've been so great to me and my family. He said, I actually now know more about the freedoms I was fighting for than when I was fighting for. The reason I want to finish with Billy Trio and Sergeant Eddie Wright is that I've decided if you're looking for the greatness of America in the size of its government, you'll always be disappointed. If you're looking for the greatest America among its people, our veterans, our community, you'll never be disappointed. We just need to quit looking to Washington for the solution to everything. We've got everything we need in our community, and frankly, in companies like this. So look, thanks for having me here today. I have a great day. Thanks.
Congressman's office. We appreciate what you have to say. Once again, let's, let's thank the Congressman.